Ladies and gentlemen, chief guest of this function, His Excellency Dr. Muhammad Al Ghazali, is honourable senior judge at the Supreme Court of Pakistan for the Sharia Appellate Bench. He is also professor and head of social sciences at the International Islamic University, Islamabad, Pakistan. He is the author of numerous works and is considered an authority on Shah Waliullah Muhaddis Dehlvi Rahmatullah Alai. May I very humbly request Justice Dr. Muhammad Al Ghazali for the keynote address. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidi al-Mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Honorable Vice Chancellor, dear brothers and sisters, it's a great honor and rare opportunity for me to be here to share my thoughts with you in this great seat of Islamic knowledge and great center of Muslim cultural unity, a living tribute to the great work done by its founder, Maulana Sayyid Ahmad, Rahmatullah alayhi, whose spirit still animates this campus, this university, all its faculties, departments, all individuals associated with this great cultural metropolis of the Muslims of India. The people associated with this institution as faculty members, students, alumni are recognizable from a distance. With due permission of the learned Vice Chancellor, may I present my humble views. The title is The Intellectual Crisis of the Ummah Revisiting the Past Patterns of Thought. In the main, there are two ways of explaining the rise and fall of peoples and communities. One is to find a rational cause for every happening in human history. This way of thinking is premised on the belief that every historical event <coughs> becomes intelligible in terms of human action and that rational reflection alone provides the key to the understanding of the rise and fall of nations, civilizations and societies. History, in short, is perceived as a purposive action by human agents. It follows its own laws. It must be conceived as ordered, structured, and predictable. Such were the givens of the modern Eurocentric worldview that rationalized the claims of Western dominance in these metaphysical tenets. The Islamic point of view, on the other hand, subordinates human will to that of God, stressing the moral responsibility of human individuals and collectivity within the sphere of freedom granted by God. Every success or failure of human societies must be attributed to the moral achievements or failings of human beings. Hence, we submit that what is often termed as intellectual failure is essentially a moral failure. The perceived intellectual failure is only an effect, not a cause. Because it is the heart from where all moral choices, according to Islamic insight, emanate. The intellect and other faculties follow the directions of the heart. We therefore believe that the present intellectual crisis and confusion is a consequence of the moral failure of those who have been placed at the position of leadership in the Muslim community. The individuals too, on their part, could not be wholly absolved of responsibility for placing such people in the position of leadership. However, since the leaders guide and direct the common people, the former carry a dual responsibility on behalf of their flock, according to the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
the leaders of the Muslims have deviated from their supreme moral duty as leaders of the Muslim Ummah. The present ills befalling the Ummah are consequences of this deviation. When one violates one's terms of appointment to an office that bestows honor and prestige, one is beset by a blindness of reason and rationality. No amount of material resources may then guide such a person intellectually. The moral failure has preceded the intellectual failure and it is responsible for the present predicament of the Ummah. The most grievous shortcoming of the Muslim Ummah today is the acute inferiority complex from which its leaders have been suffering. The causes of this complex are historical. The present leadership is more or less a legacy of the colonial era. Colonial interventions interrupted the natural progress of history in major parts of the Muslim world. Even the few areas and peoples that apparently remained outside colonial control were not left immune from conditions in which, from colonial exploitation. This dark period created conditions in which response to the ascendant alien order became the defining factor for the leadership. It either opposed this order or allied itself with it. The present leadership in the Muslim world seems to be mentally confined to the same colonial space. The various crises faced by the Ummah are often attributed to political reasons. To some people, the main problem originates from the loss of political clout. Some find its origins in the economic mismanagement of human and natural resources of the Muslim world and the resultant decline in GDP, G GNP and lesser amounts of calories consumed by the faithful. Others go beyond these levels and recognize the cause of the whole malaise in the failure of Muslims to maintain the tempo of research in the fields of empirical science and their inability to capture exports flow in the world's consumer market. Those regarded as old-fashioned assign the present helplessness to the simple cause of going away from Islam. Though these people seem to have rightly diagnosed the causes of our ailment, they fall short of defining precisely what deviation from the straight path which has led to our present predicament consists of. All these explanations might be partly true and tentatively valid in the specific contexts. However, the chief cause of all causes in our humble view is the moral failure of the leaders. This failure has exasperated the inferiority complex from which the present leadership of the Ummah has been suffering for, su for some time. The reason of this crippling complex is that the mindset of the Muslim leadership has been shaped by circumstances obtaining in the major parts of the Muslim world during the colonial times. This complex deprived them of pride in the past, confidence in the present, and faith in the future. When Muslim enterprise was derailed from the historical trajectory, following the onslaught of colonial invasion, their response to the challenges of the new order was marked by an exaggerated awe of the colonial power and a cowardly acceptance of its rule. It seemed to them that the colonizer has filled the whole space of their life world for good. Some people even accepted this phenomenon as part of their permanent fate and surrendered their will to resist. They tried to adjust to the demands of the colonial project. Others simply refused to have anything to do with alien powers and tried to live in isolation within the islands that they had created for themselves. The response of both these groups signified defeatism, betraying an unjustified fear of the hegemony of the aliens, something that continued even after the end of the colonial regime. A third group tried to create a synthesis between the demands of the tradition and the requirements of the new order thrust upon us. However, this group despite its apparent merit, did not succeed in critically assessing the new developments in depth and therefore failed to accommodate current knowledge 
and experience to the moral criteria and cultural priorities of Islam. It did not feel the need to challenge Western epistemological presumptions and try to insert Western components in the cultural scheme of Islam. This is why this group could not deliver much beyond limited and insignificant results. Yet all these responses were more or less defensive or reactive in nature, representing an inhibited mindset. When the period of naked colonization was over, the leaders of the Ummah made little effort to revive the dormant germane elements of their culture and re restore the historical continuity and progress. They could not recover from the shock of colonial captivity as a bird long imprisoned in a cage is rendered unable to fly even when freed. They still perceive the locus of power and prestige in the old symbolic seats of colonial power such as London, Paris and Amsterdam. The attitude of Central Asian leadership to the Russian Federation after their independence is a recent manifestation of the same syndrome that typifies the leaders of former colonies. In short, our leadership generally failed to rediscover our real roots and revive our own distinctive ethos. On the contrary, it defined new socio-political institutions in the terms defined by the colonial order. Its rulers took pride in wearing the shoes left by the colonial usur usurpers. Muslim leadership could not bring back the old order in all its expenses. Basically, it failed to remember the fact that the supreme status of the Ummah has been defined as harbinger of peace, justice and harmony for the entire humanity. Far from recognizing this status, it accepted its fate as a shrunken community and a reduced entity in the global scheme of things. It failed to heed the call of the Quran which demanded from its followers to bear witness to the truth revealed in this last book of guidance and on that account the Quran had granted the Muslim community the noble status of the best community raised for mankind. Instead it remained hostage to the colonial conditions of life. The continuous hostility of many religious groups towards the rulers of the Muslim countries also betrays this mindset. It has been a divine practice that individuals and groups which carry out the divinely ordained charter of inviting people to the straight path and join good and forbid evil have always enjoyed unchallenged prestige and dignity in this world. When Muslims abandoned this supreme calling, <coughs> they lost this prestige and dignity. Therefore, it is the act of abdicating the foremost obligation of the Ummah on behalf of the Prophet wasallam, which is the main cause of all the crises besetting the Ummah. The present state of fear faced by the Muslims everywhere is mainly due to the monumental failure of their leaders to recognize their supreme mission and thereby regain their real status in history. Our leaders have unconsciously abdicated this status which was granted to the Ummah by the Quran. This status essentially consisted in being torch bearers of life-giving, life-affirming message of Islam, the message of hope and felicity for the entire humanity. We are under a solemn obligation to invite humanity to the abode of peace that is Islam. It is Islam which can deliver humanity of all servitudes, whether self-imposed or enforced by others. It promises true freedom, honor, dignity and felicity here and salvation hereafter. It teaches humanity a creed of Tawheed and provides it with a value system that could enable it to transcend all man-made forms of pride and prejudice exploitation and superiority of men over men. It promises all men and women a direct link of love and obedience with one supreme master, their creator and sustainer, a link that alone could ensure ultimate freedom of man from all chains of slavery and bondage. At present we need 
to refresh in our minds the status granted to the Muslim Ummah by the Quran. The emphatic declaration of the Quran that indeed you were the best community raised for mankind, you enjoin good and forbid evil, maintain faith in Allah, kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas, ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. This verse clearly spells out the collective duty of the Muslim Ummah which has been entrusted to us by the final Prophet At a time when Muslims were much weaker in material terms, they enjoyed this status because they fulfilled their mission as the best community raised for mankind. In all periods of past history, I am not going to observe any time limit because the organizers started 40 minutes late. I have not traveled, I have not traveled uh, all the way from Islamabad to abruptly leave here. At a time when Muslims were much weaker in material terms, they enjoyed this dignified status because they fulfilled their mission as the best community. In all periods of past history, the Muslims stood on a high moral ground and enjoyed the lofty state locus of the best community so long as they recognized their basic vocation and fulfilled its requirements. A constant consciousness of this supreme collective obligation helped them maintain an attitude of sincerity and altruism towards humanity at large, thus enabling them to keep the channel of communication and dialogue open with all manner of people. The Muslims cannot regain their lost status in the world so long as they remain hostage to the terms of engagement with humanity defined by others. This state of mind has pushed the Muslims into a barren, thankless cycle of mutual phobia, hostility and skepticism towards the rest of humanity. The foremost damage of this fear and hostility towards others is that it has created irremovable barriers between them and the Prophet's ultimate audience, the entire humanity. The second damage of this mindset has been to perceive this world and its inhabitants in the prevailing Western mode of thinking. The West perceives this world and humanity in typical Darwinian terms. It regards constant conflict and competition as the natural state of human existence, as is the case in the world of nature. Under this so-called law of existence, this world and all its inhabitants must live in a constant state of mutual conflict. Only the fittest could survive here. The rest are destined to perish. However, in order to safeguard their mutual interest, human beings have agreed to a so-called social contract. Under the terms of this fictitious contract, they have consented to surrender a portion of their inherent freedom to be exercised on their behalf by the collective agency of the state. Otherwise, all will suffer on account of the chaos that will ensue, ensue from the conflicting interests of a crowd of free, self-serving individuals. However, the fiction of social contract is confined to the narrow framework of a nation-state. In their mutual relations, the states also remain at loggerheads with each other under the compulsions of the same Darwinian law. The only exception to this inherent conflict among nation states is again safeguarding their national interest. This worldview rests on the notion of essential conflict in human history at all levels except where truce is necessary to procure selfish interests of individuals, groups and nations. Contrary to this, Islam holds a positive view of human beings and regards them free from any primordial moral flaw. It considers them as the best creatures of God, created in the finest of forms. 
every individual man and woman has been recognized as potential vicegerent of Allah who has invested him, invested them with a good nature, prone to altruism, with inherent capacity for self-fulfillment as well as cooperation with other human beings. Thus Islam rejects the Western Darwinian view of the conflictual nature of man. In the perspective of Islam, peace and harmony, cooperation and concord are the original state of life. Conflict and disharmony are exceptions. The Western view is the other way around. The Muslim leadership has fallen in the trap of the anti-Islamic worldview of the Occident. Those of our leaders who have uncritically espoused this conflictual worldview include both the so-called traditionalists as well as the self-styled modernists. Both have gone far away from the essential vision of man in Islam. Some people might suppose that by emphasizing the supreme altruistic calling of the Ummah, we are rejecting the doctrine of jihad we are ejecting the doctrine of jihad from the framework of the Sharia. We are not. Jihad is an institution which is an integral part of the Sharia. However, it is linked to the total vision of Islam and therefore must be regulated by an elaborate set of norms and stipulations and is always subject to definite legal requirements. More than anything else, jihad is waged not for control over men, and their resources, but for facilitating the performance of the main duties assigned to the Ummah, namely inviting mankind to the path of truth, peace, and justice. In other words, jihad involves the use of all means, including force if necessary, in order to defend the mission and right of the Ummah to carry out the functions of enjoining good and forbidding evil extending to humanity the perpetual invitation to Islam on behalf of the last Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, promoting justice and opposing oppression in all forms. Beyond this ultimate goal, the Muslim is free to cooperate with non-Muslims in pursuing shared goals of making this world an abode of peace, mutual understanding, fair play, justice and harmony. It has happened many times in history that the pursuit of da'wah and jihad resulted in the voluntary mass conversions of new peoples into the fold of Islam. Soon these converts assumed the leadership of the ummah while the original preachers became their willing followers. Little wonder that the leadership of the ummah had been alternating between diverse stocks of humanity throughout history. Had this not been the case, this leadership would have been monopolized by the Arabs till this moment. At present, the whole perspective of our leadership seems to have become hospitable to un-Islamic ideas. It is now hostage to an endless conflict with former colonial powers and their allies. The result of this engagement is that our leaders find no time to look inwardly into themselves and recollect the time and circumstances when they were disoriented from their straight path. They look at life as recurrent compulsion of responding to the West as friends and foes. Being obsessed with this love-hate relationship with an entity that is pursuing a conscious and clear agenda of its own, our leaders have allowed themselves to be tied to the dynamics of Western power game. They have seldom thought of revisiting the ultimate power game into which they have been cleverly entangled. Quite obviously, the priorities of power game impose themselves on those who take this game for granted. The unconscious pursuit of this path has increased the distance between them and the cultural mission assigned by the Quran and bequeathed to the Prophet wasallam, to the Ummah. Now, in deference to the Vice Chancellor, whose address is important component of this, I would sum up my submissions by invoking the great message of Allama Iqbal. And we, at this moment, need to rekindle the Iqbal's fire in our hearts and souls, who said, Gartumi Khahi. 
مسلمہ زیستن نیست ممکن جز با قرآن زیستن If you want to live as Muslim, then know that it is impossible without living the Quran. It is time our intellectual, spiritual and political leaders make a sincere comeback to the Quran, recognize its irreplaceable place in our lives and redefine their mission and role in the light of its luminous and vivifying guidance. وآخر دعوانا. الحمد لله رب العالمين